I'm so glad that I'm here today. I'm so grateful um, to hear the songs, like the songs, the words mean so much in so many different ways of how I'm feeling and how I've been feeling lately with depression, emotion, the craziness in the world and um, trying to cope with our own family situations here at home. Um, they do they do sit with me very well. Um, thank you for that. I, I kind of feel like there was a presentation for me um, in the beginning here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about myself and my background. And um, normally I would call this conversation why we are the way we are. And it's um, Indigenous Month. So I want to share a bit about um, residential school that um, from what I know, um, not a very huge trigger warning, but it's it's just a blip on my journey of um, how I, I started my own healing journey. Um, so again, it's Leona Brown. I'm Gitsan through my parents and I'm Nishka through my grandparents. Um, I moved here from Prince Rupert. I lived in Prince Rupert my entire life and well, until I was in my 20s and I came to Vancouver and, you know, did the 20 year old thing for 10 years. Um, and then I had my first child when I was 30-ish in 2004. Um, and then I, my mom is feeling sick. She had a, was in an accident and um, she wasn't coping through it well. And she had passed away in 2004, three months after I gave birth to my first daughter. So I was like very thankful that she got to meet my child and hold her. Um, and then in 2007-ish, I think it was, my dad, I never grew up with my dad because my dad kind of disowned me as a child. Um, and from from the grapevine and um, in the Gitsan territory, nobody talks to me there. They don't acknowledge me as family or anything, but um, one person had shared that he didn't believe that I was his child. Um, which is why he abandoned me with my mom and my mom left him because of physical abuse. Him and my mother had met in residential school, I believe, um, in Edmonton residential school. Um, and uh, I guess they got together after as many people had done after residential school, just so they have that bit of freedom. Um, started having children and yeah, the, my upbringing wasn't very well. It was, um, my mom was pretty much on her own for a while. Um, she went through some grieving and mourning because she had a partner, um, my younger brother's dad, who had went missing in the waters in Port Edward. Um, he was a logger and she mourned him till the day she died in 2004. She missed him a lot and I, I didn't understand any of that um my upbringing um was pretty rough and and you know we I grew up with parents or parent figures that were abandoning us and um uh, going out drinking and partying and I, I never understood why but everybody did it so it kind of felt normal that a lot of us were left home alone um to give you an idea, it's like, I think the youngest I remember being home alone is like three years old. Um, my first memory of responsibility, I, I had a younger brother that's two years younger than me, but my first time I remember like adult responsibility, um, I guess was in 1980. And my mom, I don't remember her being pregnant because a lot of my memories of that have like dissipated and she had brought home this tiny little baby and she put it in the room with us and she left for like a whole week just disappeared went on her drinking and left me with this literal newborn baby um and i did my best to care for this this thing <laughs> i didn't know what to do i um one of the memories that stick with me is that 
I think a few days later, the, the umbilical cord was like fully drying out and it was on his um, drying out on an, under his diaper. Um, I literally had to learn everything on my own, how to change his diaper, what to feed him. Um, when I changed his diaper a few days later, the, the cord stuck to his diaper and came off and it terrified me. I was so scared. I was like walking around the house and I'm like, how old am I? In, um, seven years old in 1980. And I'm walking around. I'm terrified my mom because the, the you know, physical abuse was discipline for us. And I thought my mom was going to like murder me or something because this belly button fell off. Um, and she didn't even notice. I never, never got in any trouble for that. But that's a memory that sticks with me as a child, like having that responsibility so young um, and not knowing what to do. And then I think it, this went on for her for years. She was always an alcoholic, but this, this situation, our life situation was like, we're living in people's basements. Um, we barely had any food, if any food, most times. Um, my brother and I, that was two, two years younger than me, um, I had to kind of care for him and bring him to school and be responsible in that sense. And I remember things being so dire sometimes, af even after the baby was born, it, like we had one loaf of bread in the house and we had to share it and try to make it last. Um, the one loaf of bread between the two of us and we're um, just having one slice each every day. And we ran out of the butter. And I remember that we we, we found a lard and put lard on there and a little bit of sugar to make it taste better because we we got to eat something. So a lot of my my upbringing until I maybe I was twelve um, was pretty much alone with two kids and having that responsibility and um, in a home that my parents there was no parenting that was going on. And I never understood why as I was getting older, you know, I was a typical teen of with the running away, um, thinking, why are my parents like this? I want different parents. I don't like this situation. Um, so much deeper than at that, when my the baby was brought home, his father um, from that point on started sexually abusing me. Um, so there was another reason, like, why is nobody protecting me? Where is my father in this situation? Why doesn't he come and save me? And this went on until the day I left when I was 22. And I had feelings like my mom knew about it. Um, she had to know that it was continuing because I was taken from, from her care by welfare. Several times through my teenage years, I tried to call for help and nobody protected me. So when I was 22, I ran and I had two brothers here in Vancouver that were older than me. And I ran here to, to live with them um, and just started living my freedom and um, had my first child in 2004. And I wanted to like break cycles because I was terrified pregnant with my first child and my first child is a girl and I'm a girl that grew up with that abuse and I was terrified. I was scared that, am I going to be able to protect her? Am I going to be able to know if anything's wrong? If somebody's, you know, repeating a cycle with her, am I going to be able to know and protect her and stand up for her? I was so terrified. And then when she came out, it was, it was instant. I knew I'm going, I'm going to look after this one and I'm going to make sure, you know, we, she knows my history and um, upbringing and I, I would give her a better life than what I had. Um, so 2004, and I guess people were starting talking about truth and reconciliation. 2013, I was pregnant um, or between 2010 and 2016, I was in the process of um, taking my brother's child because he had passed away in July 2010. So I was in the process of um, getting custody of my niece. 
And that was a whole big ordeal because going to the court and, you know, the judge accusing me of because of my, my partner's history and my son's dad's history, telling me that if I was going to get an irresponsible partner like that, how can he trust that I would look after this child? And I'm telling him, like, I already have one child. I've had no issues with welfare with this one child. She's like 10, 12 now. Um, and I'm pregnant with the, my second one. And I told them that we're on a healing journey. And I just felt super judged, um, unfairly biased, judged by by somebody just and I felt like because I'm native um so by 2013 um truth and reconciliation had arrived and by then both my parents were gone so I couldn't ask them questions I couldn't sit and listen with them my grandparents are already gone I went to the convention um that when it came here in Vancouver and I listened to some of the elders share their stories I thought okay well We'll listen in um, and they're not just stories it's their their life experience and it was horrifying listening to these elder people talk about what happened to them physically emotionally through residential school um, I instantly had forgiveness for both my parents at, at that time I was you know a little bit more mature and I I was listening to all these experiences that others had and I, I felt like oh my that's that's why we are the way we are so when I talk about my history like this that's what I like to title it why we are the way we are um, I had instant understanding she was I, I remember her telling me when I was younger she said that she went to residential school but all she shared was the moment she was taken away um she was young she was very young um and she remembers like she didn't want to go they're coming into the the reservations they're taking children and she didn't want to go and I guess she was a bit of a daddy's girl so when my dad or my grandpa was a preacher in New Ayanch um so he had to let her go and she she was being you know I, I am imagining she's being yanked away she's telling me they're pulling her away from her dad and she's trying to claw onto her dad and she's screaming and crying dad help me dad I don't want to go I don't want to go dad help me and she's being yanked away and this this image has been stuck in my head this entire time until the truth and reconciliation happened then it clicked and I was like, oh my gosh, I had that forgiveness for them because I, I understood like, if you were raised in this situation, how are you expected to raise children of your own if you weren't taught those skills to raise children? You were taught to abuse, ignore, abandon, neglect. You were taught all these bad things. And then you're expected to parent when you have a child. Um, so I immediately understood I went to the sacred fire and I prayed for them and I cried and I even forgave my dad who didn't want to talk to me on his deathbed because he still believed I wasn't his child um, I had so much forgiveness for them because I was like it's it's no wonder you couldn't you couldn't parent properly because you weren't taught those skills um and then it started opening, you know, my view to life. When when I started fighting for custody for my niece, I felt that racism in the system. I felt it from the judge. I felt it that in a way that I couldn't speak up at the court. Um, I started absorbing information from other people who, other parents who had issues with welfare and how to speak. I always get a third party take notes, keep um, all the papers, um, and I always go for, you know, this underground information system. It was unbelievable that we, it was even there because when I first started out in this system, I, I was like, oh, no, I don't need that. I've, 
you know, I've had a pretty successful life already. I have one child. I don't think they're going to, you know, put me through the ringer. I'm not going to need this. And people had told me these, these cases with children um, in, in the system or when they feel like you're, you're not a good enough parent. As soon as they put you on this list, it goes for three years. So, so many people knew and shared this information amongst each other that all this information was provided to me. And I'm like, no, it's not going to last three years. I'm going to get my kids and I'm going to show them that I'm a good parent. Um, I never had any problems with my first child. Um, absolutely, almost to the date, it was three years that they were in our lives. Um, and then they, they made it even stricter because my son's dad at the time, he had, you know, some issues with his children before, you know, and in transparency, he did have, um, you know, three jobs and then his girlfriends, the mothers would leave him with the, you know, an infant baby and he has mental health issues of his own. So he hurt his baby. Um, and that information was shared with me. So they took that and they ran with it. So we couldn't even do start a relationship. We had plans to, for him to go on his healing journey, get his mental health in check and like deal with his anger issues. What is going on um, before we moved in together? Because we're having a child together. This was planned out. Uh, we never got that chance to do it. Uh, three years, it was too much. We couldn't live together. Every time he came in the house, I had to fight for schedules for him to be in the house four days a week. And it had to be supervised for the entire time. So we would he would come in the house and be here for four hours because I said, I want him here to uh, be with the children, have dinner, and then participate in the bedtime part because he's never really parented himself um so we we went through three years of that exactly and then i two years in i called for um they our community advised you to call for um a hearing a trial um and if they have a trial then they start changing their their situation but um it still didn't work out i still had to fight it was horrible um, that I had to do this for three years, our life just torn apart and we're separated and, you know, all that anger and stuff, we're still learning to communicate to each other. And I'm still trying to deal with truth and reconciliation. How do I break this cycle of anger when we don't agree with each other? Um, it's very hard to do when you're grown, when you're growing up as a child and you're abandoned or, and whenever you know, mom was home and we were too loud or if we did something wrong, we were beaten, you know, we're yelled at, we're screamed at, we're called names. So coming out of that cycle, of not even learning how to communicate, and this is the only way you communicate, was very difficult. I've, I'm still going through this journey right now because my 13-year-old, Jessica, who is the one that I adopted, is you know, doing the typical teen stuff and running away, but she really stands up towards me and um, confronts me most times. And I have to like move her and she won't move and she'll do her shutdown phase. It's, it was really, it's been really difficult the past few months to learn how to talk to her without anger. Cause I've learned, like, I guess she's really a lot like me and her stubbornness and what she wants to do in life and that you know to me it triggers me and that brings back you know memories of my mom yelling and screaming at me the only way to resolve a situation is that I have to beat you and I have to yank you around and yell at you and scream at you <clears throat> so I thought you know I thought I was being a good parent until she hit those teenage years and then all this this memory and this um you know upbringing these uh, cycles had come back and so I'm still working on myself and I've come to the realization that I'm probably never going to be able to grow up I'm, I'm always going to 
you know, have to learn to communicate with them differently through their different stages of life. You know, they were different human beings as babies. They're different human beings as toddlers, as children, as teenagers. My oldest is now 19, so I'm learning how to communicate with her differently than when she was a teenager now. Um, but we always try to share our feelings here, too, and um, have that transparency of, you know, I have chronic back pain, and that makes me really angry sometimes when I have to go out and do things. Um, when I'm shopping is a big one, and I, by the time I get to the cash register, I'm grumpy. And I try to be transparent with my kids as they're with me. And, and I'm like, hurry up and get this done. Get, can you just put that in a cart? And I, I feel my face being like really grumpy looking. And I have to wait till I get home and, you know, calm myself down. And I apologize to my kids. I'm so sorry. I, you know, I snapped at you. I'm still trying to learn how to cope through this pain. It's not you. It's the pain that I'm dealing with. I don't. I can't, you know, communicate effectively when I'm in so much pain. Um, that transparency has to be there for us because that's not what I got as a child. I never knew why my mom left us alone. I never knew why she never bought us groceries and, you know, kind of abandoned us when she went out drinking. I mean, realistically, I never knew she was always drinking every time she left the house. I just knew that she was gone. So after truth and reconciliation, I really wanted to change that cycle for me and my kids. And I wanted my kids to have a better journey ahead of them. And as we're sharing with um, other groups and indigenous and talking with the indigenous elders about uh, our upbringings, you know, we're also sharing knowledge and they're reminding us that, you know, the, the trauma that we feel is generational, it's genetic. Um, there's trauma that um, I have from my mother. Um, there's trauma that I experienced, the, the, the abuse, the sexual abuse that I've had. I've transferred that to my child. Um, and I never really thought about that. And that never really clicked in until my teenager was a teen or my, my oldest was a teenager, like 14, 15 um, she really started expressing she didn't like to be around men, men, teachers, principals, authority. She didn't like it. She wouldn't communicate. She would just be silent. And then I sat and I thought about those moments. I, I was pregnant with her and my, my thoughts of being like, oh my gosh, is she going to be abused too when she grows up? I feel like learning from my elders, I may have inadvertently passed that those thoughts down to her. And I shared that with her as she grew older, 17, 18, that, you know, these, this is how I felt when I was pregnant with you. So this could be why you feel the way you feel most times and that you don't, you don't really like men. Um, it's not that she doesn't like their personality or anything. She just has this feeling like, oh, I don't want to be around you. I don't want to talk to you. Um, so we, we shared that. And so a lot, of, a lot of stuff that I've experienced and what I see that they're experiencing, I, we try to sit down sometimes, you know, and talk about it um, and share. You know, you're not, you may be thinking, why am I feeling this way? And it, it's not from like any abuse that you don't remember. It's probably the, you know, the thoughts that I genetically passed down to you. So we try to take care of ourselves and heal from the history that we learned, that I learned from the residential school system. And then um, I try to understand like it's, it's unbelievable that this system still exists today. It exists through the child and welfare system. Um, hugely racial in this Vancouver city because they have the Vancouver Aboriginal Child and Family Services, which is where you're directed to, you're put in this box. If, if you, any of your children are reported or apprehended, you're sent to VACFAS. Um, and I think that's where my journey of advocacy started in 2013. I decided like, what am I gonna do in this life? I, I don't have like the typical culture. 
um, that other people have of dancing and doing art. But I wanted to live my life as an Indigenous person with that identity. And I think in COVID hits, everybody's like on Zoom. And I meet up with the Vancouver Aboriginal or the Vancouver Urban Food Forest Foundation. And I did some training, as we mentioned earlier with Jolene Andrew about the uh, medicinal herbs. And it was classified under teas, but I, I didn't quite get it. I wasn't really into it right away um, until probably 2020. But I, I did learn a lot of med medicinal tea medicine and then, you know, truth and reconciliation and COVID happens and that gives me opportunity to sit and think, okay, what am I going to do in this path? I've, I've tried to be an advocate through child and welfare um, and sharing information with other parents that are going through the same issues. Um, that wasn't being very successful. Um but after COVID and I started doing Zooms, I started talking about <clears throat> how I feel that we need to learn our medicines. I felt that was important to me. We need to learn our plant medicines. That's one way to start reconnecting, resurfacing with your own Indigenous history. Um, and I felt it important to me because my daughter at 17 was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. So we look to our medicinal medicines to help her through her pains. Um, and that's what really got me started, just my own, ex own personal experiences. And um, Vancouver Urban Food Forest, Voth, had um, this plan with the Vancouver Parks to create garden spaces under um, food forests. And they were having problems, you know, getting a space and they called me in and I, I thought maybe this should be indigenous led and I could be an advocate in this space and help talk to board the parks board with you and the importance of having this food forest. And then it just kind of went its own way. I, I mm -hmm. felt like this is what I'm going to do is advocate for indigenous people and one way to, of doing this healing and reconciliation for me was the land. We have to get back to the land. We have to understand where we are. Um, how was the land before colonization? Um, and I know if you get back to your plant medicines, we would start living a little bit better life and in healing and getting in your hands into the dirt and stuff. So yeah, just explore, exploded my, my advocacy. It just, kind of happened I didn't plan to go this way I thought okay I'm going to be a land steward we're going to work in the dirt it I never worked in the dirt at all yet because I I was pulled on to the Vuff um, co-creators group and um, invited to be their advocate so I I get paid honorariums to do that when they need me to and now I'm because of advocacy and I'm trying to explain in every situation, you know, the importance of garden work, the importance of being back to the land, the importance of indigenous people getting back to their culture, but more importantly, of giving a safe space to be heard. These garden spaces became that, that healing circle that I wanted to develop and allow people to come in to be heard, to heal, to pray, and just look at the garden if that's all they needed to do. Um, and that just led me into so many different advocacy avenues. Not only do I work with Buff, um, I work with the Vancouver um, <clears throat> Food Forest Foundation with the, um, I mean, not the, the Vancouver Food Systems, Neighborhood Foods, um, oh, I can't remember it, but we created a new group called the Vancouver Co Justice Coalition. Um, and we talk about in, the importance of Indigenous connection and reconciliation. Um, this path had led me to sitting on the DPAC board of the Vancouver School Board. Um, and I'm in the Indigenous Education Council with the Three Nations. I'm talking about um, 
you know, what needs to improve in the schools for Indigenous people. Um, I sit on the city committees with the Vancouver Food Policy Committee, and now I sit with the Urban Indigenous People's Advocacy Committee, I believe it's called. <clears throat> So it's interesting work, and I, I also um, sit with parks and, and trying to change policies around um, Indigenous access to land with the Local Food Systems Action Plan. Um, so it's it started with tea plants and possibly opening up gardens to work in and teach people and share knowledge to now I'm just a full-on advocate and um share my story everywhere in my experience and my journey. Uh, I also sat with the Single Mothers Alliance for a while. They're called the Center of Family Equity now. And that was a provincial level of advocacy and uh, participating in working groups to, you know, advocate for whatever family needs that there were for for those parents on, on the provincial level. So I had opportunities to talk with like MLAs. Um, and then I think in, when Ken Sims, that election happened, I ran in that election. I thought if, uh, if I wanted to change this city and what's happening here, maybe that would be one way to do it. Um, I didn't initially go in right away, which I should have. We, we did a couple of months of, um, campaigning sort of but it was very last minute and my only point around that was to like I wanted to get out there and get the indigenous voters to vote because nobody voted I never even voted very much because I thought what's the point they're not we're not going to get enough votes to get the person in there that we need and are they going to really listen to us um, so I wanted to get out there and just get voters to vote the indigenous community to vote um, and it got up there. So I, I came in like six below the, the major parties, the number number one in independence. Um, so that was that was OK. And then because I was doing the a lot of the um, debating sessions that happened around the city <clears throat> and I was already doing advocacy work in the, the three uh, sectors of VSB and parks and the city. I thought maybe this is something I should be taking seriously. Um, so after I lost, <laughs> kind of stepped on my heart a little bit, but I'm like, okay, maybe Ken Sims will be great because he's, you know, he's Asian and there has to be some, something good out of this. And it turns out for, from my point of view as an indigenous person, it's not okay because we, you know, I was part of the community that worked really hard to advocate for police out of schools. And that was the first thing he put back into the schools, regardless of many of us going on to the council meeting and pleading, no, we don't need this. We're reconciling. We, we don't want them back in school. This is so much harm that you're doing. We were completely ignored and he did what he wanted to do. And because he has a majority majority of um, council on three sectors, I felt defeated because now this hampers the work that I'm doing. I felt like giving up um, for a while and just like, why, why even bother? Because they're not going to listen to anything. Um, <clears throat> but I, I got some confidence back in being in community and, um, I was going to run for MLA, but I found that experience very difficult. The Green Party had invited me to um, be a part of their their run because Melanie Mark had dropped out and they were going to do an election for her spot. Um, so I was being vetted through the Green Party and there was four other people. And then it turned out to be just the two of us. Um, but I didn't get enough membership or something to, to get the votes that I needed. So I didn't win that vetting. But through the process of it, it was like really surprising of how much paperwork you had to do. It was so confusing for an, an Indigenous person. You, you know, you don't understand so much of this legal mumble jumble. And like, I couldn't even talk, like sign an NDA that I couldn't say that I'm being vetted by Green Party 
um, and who else was being vetted. Uh, it just felt like so much control over something that I want to do. Um, and that's when I decided like, okay, if I'm going to run for anything, it's, I'm going to remain independent because I don't need anybody telling me my platform. Um, so I didn't win. I was going to run in this last MLA, but I was reminded like my youngest is only 11 and being an MLA requires you to be in Victoria four days a week um, when they're in session. That's a long time to be away from my son, but they do give you like, you know, help to go there and come back. And, but I'm like, that would be exhausting going back and forth or having to homeschool my son. He's only 11. I don't think I can do this yet. Almost was going to sign on again um, this year because we have elections in October. But I thought, no, I want to cherish this time with my son while he's still 11 and he's still a kid. Maybe at the next round I will. And then I just focused on, oh yeah, Ken Sims. Um, I think I'm going to run in the next mayor run and, and take him out <laughs> because he's not doing anything good. And, you know, just having that in my mind of him forcing us to have police back in schools had got me angry. And I'm like, we don't, he's already fundraising his campaign money for the next election. And I'm like, you're pretty bold. Um, so I'm, I'm uplifted to, to maybe do that again and run for mayor. I have a lot of allies in the community because I work in so many different spaces. So many people know me. I've done media, news articles, CBC, everything. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty certain I'll, I'll get pretty close to winning next time, but at, at least we'll get, um, I think we'll get in more voters this time. Um, so this has been my journey from, you know, where I came from, understanding my parents, not holding that anger in because of the way they were. And I gave them that forgiveness. I give my kids my love and I'm, I'm trying to break cycles with them and I'm still healing. I still um, do not control anybody's life that, um, you know, the, the lady who mentioned her sister passing, it's her choice, right? It's, it's learning to sit back and let it go. That's the, yes, it's her choice. And it's really hard and it's difficult because watching my mom in the hospital when she passed was really hard. Um, having to go and, you know, sign the paper to shut the machines off was very difficult. It was a very difficult year or so after. Um, but Elvis had reminded me, you know, it's, it's really trying not to focus on the negative, which is why we call it the celebration of life. We want to, if you have the opportunity, like I wish, I wish I knew that when she was going to die, I would have had more positive moments with her and I would have been there all the time with her. And I, I couldn't, I would have probably asked her a little bit more questions about how was she as a child, you know, share some happy memories of her, my grandpa and everything. But I think if you're facing these situation, it's, it's a healing journey for sure. It's a new experience and it hurts, but it's learning to take that deep breath and, and accept what you cannot control and accept the journey that you're going to be on whether it's experiencing somebody passing, you're losing a job, you have to move out of your house or anything. It's an experience. It's, it can be sad. You have a grieving, acknowledging your feelings and just truly trying to be with yourself and be strong and not fall into those holes of depression. Um, thinking about anything like me, I've with you know, thinking about my past and the abuse and the neglect, like occasionally, even today, I still fall in those, you know, a couple of days of depression, because I have to sit and think about, okay, how am I going to cope through this a little bit better? How am I going to move forward with my children like this? And really just praying in myself and, and being in community for me works. And finding even just that one person to be like, 
let's go and chat let's have coffee together let's chat and meeting people that just like sit and listen and are open to no matter how long the conversation is and I give an example of the Indigenous early years at 717 Princess. Um, I signed up for the Family Violence Intervention Program because I've, I've done it before and it's a good program. And I know that um, these tools will help me again with my teenager being in a group home. I it, it was meant to be like a half an hour intake interview and they weren't very busy so they you know they asked me how I felt and I'm like I don't know if you have time <laughs> and they were like no 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 we have time so they we sat and talked with each other about parenting and it was super amazing I have panic but chronic back pain and normally I have to get up and sit up or stand up for a minute and during that whole conversation that started at 11 30 and we finished at two I had no back pain in my back for the rest of the day. I felt fantastic. And it was all because I was able to share my feelings, my frustrations, and they listened to me and they related to me and they shared, you know, their family troubles with their children. And it just felt fantastic. So I feel like COVID really isolated a lot of us too. So we, when we're getting back out there, we, we feel like we don't want to burden people but I think if you feel it in your gut to share, share. If, you, if you're if you welcome to, no, 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 I got enough time to just share and be honest about yourself. And I think that's one way of, um, and especially with Indigenous people, is just talking it through. Typically, we would have an elder, you know, grandma or somebody that we talk to, talk it out with. Um, and we don't have that these days. And we don't have a lot of you know, connection and community like that. And I want to encourage that more. Um, I, I too open myself to these conversations, like, because it goes both ways. If you want to connect with me and go have coffee and let's talk for a couple hours, I'm totally open to that too. Um, because I know we need to be heard when we're in our feelings about things. And um, that's me. And that was my journey, my healing journey that I'm still on. And I'm grateful to be here and grateful to listen to all the songs and the good words and seeing your wonderful faces has been fantastic. Thank you. Hamia. Samogat Lahach Hamia is Gitsan for thank you, creator. <laughs>